Greetings, everybody. Happy Sunday, and welcome to TV Skywriter. I'm Pat Murray, your host. TV Skywriter is where I talk to people from around the world about music, art, creativity, etc., etc. And today, I'm very happy to have fellow Durhamites. Actually, you weren't born in Durham. We'll talk about that. But we do have Kate McGarry and Keith Gantz, both on TV Skywriter. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Very happy to have you. Now, I know that, um, Kate, you're a great singer. Keith, you're a great guitarist. And together, you have a wonderful CD that, is it, is it just out, or is it just out this year? Yeah, out in February, yeah. Okay, and it's called Genevieve and Ferdinand. That's right. That's an interesting name. Why is it called Genevieve and Ferdinand? No, you want to tell them? I always tell them. <laughs> um, Kate came up with that name. You know, all, all uh, Kate's previous albums that, that we've done together have been usually with a quintet at least, uh, you know, with bass and drums and all that. And when we, were, when we do our duo thing, uh, we didn't just want to call it duo, you know, just because in jazz often the group just gets named by how many people are in the band, and that just seemed a little... A little too utilitarian for our sure. duo. Felt real more different from from the from the larger group than just the number of people. You sure, know. sure. Felt like a whole different band, and like we play a little bit different material, and we go more into singer songwriter kind of stuff and mm -hmm. atmospheric stuff. So it wanted to have more of like a band name rather than just. Kate McGarry Keith Gans duo. So, uh, <laughs> bless you, bless you. And uh, Kate just came up with with the name Genevieve and Ferdinand. Genevieve is her middle name. Oh, okay, okay. And, and Ferdinand is Ferdinand the bull from that children's story about the the bull who just oh, like, oh I like, love that story. That's him. <laughs> <laughs> that that's the story where the bull is smelling the flowers at the side of the road, right? Or something, like, or something like that. Uh, he doesn't yeah. want to be in the bullfights. He doesn't care about fighting. He just likes to sit mm -hmm. out in the field and smell the flowers. Exactly. I love that story. <laughs> That's her way of, of dressing up me being lazy. <laughs> <laughs> so how did, how did the two of you meet? Um, how did you, first, let me ask, how did both of you get started in music? I've just always wanted to sing since I was like three years old. And I've just been... Or, Earlier, <laughs> yeah, her, her mom used to tell stories about her singing "Hello Dolly" when she was like 15 months, 15 months old. Hello Dolly. <laughs> well, that is so weird because that's the one song my baby brother used to sing when he was like three or four years old. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's a song. I've just always wanted to sing. There was never anything else I was really any good at, <laughs> and uh, so that's what I've been doing forever. And and then. I meet, met Keith like um, 10 years ago or a little more than that, 10 years ago in New York. So are both of you from New York? Neither of us are from New York, but that's that's where we met, Cape, oh, okay. Cape Cod, and I'm from North Carolina. Oh, okay. We, but we both just happened to arrive in New York in August of 1998 and yeah. then <laughs> met on a gig sometime after that. And then got together like a year later. Yeah, isn't yeah. that isn't that wonderful? Now, Keith, how did you get started with guitar? And did you start out playing jazz? Uh, no, I played you know some piano and saxophone maybe in school band when you know when I was little, and then in high school um, got into guitar, you know, rock like Jimi Hendrix and mm -hmm. Rush and Led Zeppelin and all that stuff. Cool. <laughs> But uh, pretty quickly, I guess from progressive rock, you know, I kind of got interested in more complicated uh, music, which led to fusion and then eventually jazz, and then I then I got into straight ahead jazz, and uh, yeah, and then I then after that I got really into folk, like uh, acoustic guitar, not necessarily like folk guitar, but acoustic guitar fingerstyle stuff. Sure. Sure. So now it's kind of I kind of do all those things, not so much the the rock, but the jazz and the fingerstyle. Now, if you don't mind my asking, um, 
I'm just curious as to how you got such a good feel for Brazilian sounds because um, not every American can really get into that Brazilian groove the way you can. Oh, thank you. You know, I, I never, I never really actually learned like listen to Brazilian guitar players and and learn exactly what they're what they do. Unlike you know bebop, where I transcribed lots of solos and learned exactly what they were doing. Sure. Uh, I'm I'm more just trying to, to create this just the feel the the way it felt to me like of Brazilian music, not so much. So I, I don't think I play those guitar parts the way an, an actual Brazilian guitarist plays them, but I just kind of tried to create the the feel of the of Brazilian music as a whole, like with with bass and percussion, just the whole rhythmic. Feeling, I, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> you know, why. It sounds, it sounds great. Thanks, <laughs> thank you. I've, yeah, I've been complimented on it before, even by Brazilians. It's just kind of funny because, because I didn't, I didn't study it. You know, a lot of times we'll play with, with you know, a drummer or something like Clarence Penn, who knows all the different, you know, every different type of Brazilian beat and what they're called and where the accent goes and. And when we play together, like we're about to do a Brazilian tune, he'll be like, "Is this a tune bow or is this this it?" And I'm like, "I don't know. I'm just gonna play and you know, just play along with me." <laughs> so I don't really know, you know, exactly what I'm doing, but but I just he makes it feel good. I just go for a good feel, and and, and I've heard from a few Brazilians that that they like that that when we do Brazilian stuff that we don't try to do it exactly like them, that we right. we do it our own way, but it still has kind of some kind of feeling of that's that sounds authentic, even if it's not actually stylistically so so much exactly like the way they play it. Well, like, I think that's I think that's the best part about music and 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 jazz and Brazilian music, which is kind of jazzy, um, at least to my ears. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't want to sound I don't want to hear textbook music anyway. I want to hear what you feel about music and. Right. Yeah, that works for me. Yeah, and I think they feel the same way because I guess they often hear people trying to, you know, sort of do it by the textbook, and and so people are told they don't like that. So. <laughs> Brazilian people, so, yeah. yeah, like don't try to make it sound too, you know, much like be too authentic because you can't really, you can't really be authentic. All you can do is, you know, try and know about the the history and do your listening, and and then make something that's your own out of it. And so if you do do that, then you're successful. You know? Yeah, it would be, probably be like, you know, someone, you hear someone that's really imitating a soul singer, you know, imitating the way they sing. Mm -hmm. That might not sound so great as if they just sang the way they sing, but with a lot of feeling, you know. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> now, I'd like, if you don't mind my asking this, if you sure. could compare your latest CD, which is Genevieve and Ferdinand, with Girl Talk, which was your previous CD. Hmm. Well, it's it's kind of night night and day because we for for um, Genevieve and Ferdinand, we really just we wanted to um, it's a live CD and we wanted to just show um, what our duo is like and, and the material we've we've developed and just kind of give a feeling of a of a live. Um, uh, concert and that's exactly what we did. We had people into the studio and um, and we just had a concert in the studio and recorded it. And so because of that, it has you know a lot more of the folk elements and it's got um, more originals and girl talk. We were we were trying to make a little more of a straight head a straight ahead record or more standards. We didn't put any originals on it and um, we usually. We usually do something where we take a pop, some kind of pop tune and, and put more of a spin, uh, jazz spin on it. And for Girl Talk, we just didn't do any of that. We we just made arrangements out of the standards or sang them straight ahead. And um, so it's it's a very different record. Um, yeah, and Jennifer Ferdinand and I. I'm really I was really glad to let go of the big the bigger group and um, just explore working together as a duo and that's what we've been really enjoying. Now I know your latest CD was recorded at Sound Pure um, in downtown Durham. I mean I did read that you recorded it live so is that more pressure or less 
pressure because you just have to just go with the flow. Both. That's kind of weird. <laughs> you know, for for me it was it was easier because uh, you know we, we went we actually so we did the live show we did two sets we probably did I don't know 15 tunes or something and then there was a couple of tunes that we didn't get to that we that we wanted to try so we went back the next day to the same studio you know we left everything set up everything mm -hmm. was exactly the same except that there was no audience there and it, it was so much harder for for me to get to get into it it was like you know, it was the exact same situation, except for it was like the audience just went home, and then I don't what know. Was, well, what difference does does the um, the presence of the audience make for you? Well, for me, especially playing with Kate, you know, her when she sings, she's such a communicator. She's really just telling a story to the audience, you know. And then as as she tells the story, you know, I'm accompanying her, and and there's a feeling in the room of the, the story she's telling, and the people are listening and, and uh, you know and then I, I'm just kind of doing like the soundtrack to this whole thing that's going on between her and the audience is what it feels like to me uh, almost like a movie or something and I'm doing the soundtrack mm -hmm. and so if the, if the audience isn't there I don't know it's just a little it's just different for me and I kind of not then I feel like well I have all these options of which way I could go but I'm, I don't really know which way to go somehow the feeling of the of the energy in the room with the audience makes me more decisive about about which way to go. Like, okay, this, this is the way it's going. To me, it's sort of like if you have a, a plant um, that you didn't water for a while, and then you pour water on it, and you watch it just go like, woo! <laughs> That's what's the difference between singing with no, with not to anybody, and then singing to people. It's like I feel like I come alive and feel connected, and it's really a nicer experience. That's really interesting because my sister's an actor and she was trying to explain to me how the presence of an audience makes a huge difference. I mean, she could tell whether they're into it or not. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't, well, I'm not an actor or, you know, I don't play out as a musician. Um, I, I don't know what it's like, really. And this sounds really intriguing to me that an audience that you can actually feel what the audience is feeling. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's not, yeah, and it's sort of like a, it's sort of like an ecosystem, you know. It's like a a mini ecosystem. You, everyone comes into the room, and maybe they have their drinks or whatever. They're there with their friends or their loved ones, and um, and then the door closes, and then it's sort of like, you know, it's like a things start to grow, and and but it's and it's it has its own. Uh, I don't know. There's something about it that feels like soil and something growing really fast. So I can imagine then, do you want all of your future CDs to be recorded live then? No. Um, I like it, but I... It's not necessarily. Uh, it was neat to not be able to go back and fix anything. You know what I mean? <laughs> like other times, I was really grateful that I could go back and fix stuff. Um, on other things, you know, do overdubs or, or something if it needed, but this, you really couldn't do anything. It was sort of like, however it came out, that was it. And so that, there was something really nice about that and to feel like, oh, I can do that, you know. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But I like, I like both things. Yeah, both things, you know, kind of, kind of give you different, different options. Well, here's my next question, because you do originals, but I have a question about standards. Mm -hmm. How do you choose them? How do you know when a song is right for you? I mean, is it enough that you just like the tune, or do you have to relate to it in some kind of way, both of you, in order to play it, or perform it, I should say? What a nice question. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's, um, it's a really deep process that takes sometimes years <laughs> of like of 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 a picking what tune to do like like when i did i did a tune called show me and it was just like it took like 3 years or something to kind of get the uh oh no it was more than that i first heard it in like 1988 or something and was like oh, i'm going to do that song and it just it was like this really slow kind of figuring out of what 
I wanted to say on it, and you know, like ten years later, I recorded it, and um, wow. and it's sort of like that. Like it has to go through. It has to be about something for me, and it has to be. Um, and there has to be a story that she can tell that she feels like she has has something to say yeah. on that story. And if it if I don't have that, it's very easy for it to just feel you know sort of trite or whatever. But if I do, it, it has an opportunity to really go a lot deeper and um, and yeah. And then the the arrangement comes out of whatever that feeling is that I have about the, the story, and that is that's always the roots of the of why the song feels different or why it feels personal or what makes it different from just any old standard. Is it easy to determine how to perform the song? In other words, whether it's going to be slow or fast or whether it's going to be bossa nova or ballad or straight ahead or you know no, whatever the groove is? Yeah, that's that's part of the the mystery of it. It's sort of like I'm Unveils itself little by little in little pieces, and I, you know, and then some. Sometimes, I mean, we do it different ways. Sometimes, I'll ask Keith to to arrange a song, and and maybe I'll have an idea for it, or maybe I won't, and he'll just, you know, do it how he feels. So he has his own his own way. So maybe he can tell about his, his way of doing it. Well, often she'll she'll say, <clears throat> "I want to do this song," and she'll usually have some kind of basic uh, vibe that she's going for, like, you know, maybe a tempo and a mood, at, at least, and then I'll, I can take that and kind of, you know, alter the chords a little bit that to make it enhance that mood that she's going for, you know, make it more specific to that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I like to try to you know, I don't change, necessarily change the chords just to change them, but just to create, you know, that that scene that she's trying to the picture she's trying to make with that song. Um, so, uh, like the the song "Let's Face the Music and Dance" that's on Genevieve and Ferdinand. I don't know yeah. if you remember that, but I do, I do. Yeah, it's a great so, time. but it's a really very different arrangement than. I've ever heard of that song, and um, you know it's, it's an Irving Berlin song from like the 30s or something. So, um, and I just I felt like I wanted it to be sort of to reflect the uncertainty of these times and sort mm -hmm. of the spirit of of the mystery of like not knowing, you know, what's going to happen in life, but also um, and sort of some sadness about. About um, not being able to, you know, hold on to things, and and but also like that you have to go ahead and live live your life, and we, you know, talked about it, and maybe I had like a basic, some kind of basic feeling, and then he just took it and, you know, it's beautiful, it's really beautiful. Thanks, thank you. That that song I actually sort of had the benefit. I mean, I'm sure lots of uh, traditional jazz composers. Not like, <laughs> not like this, but kind of had the benefit of not really knowing the song, so I wasn't, uh, I didn't have the harmony of the actual song really that much in my mind. I just looked at a lead sheet and took oh, the interesting. and oh, just wow. reset the melody to the chords how I heard it and and to support the the mood that she was going for. And I really love what what came out, and probably if I knew the song better. I, I might not have gone so far, you know, away from them. So that made it all the more interesting, in my opinion. Now, yeah. that, now, now that I know the backstory. Yeah. So yeah. So, are there some songs that you are sort of noodling around with now that maybe in the next couple of years you'll be recording? Do you listen to like the uh, like the pop songs that are out today, or are you going back to listen to like maybe? music you grew up with in order to uh, yeah. find, find songs for your next upcoming CDs? I'm more going backwards, um, like Leonard Cohen, there's a song called Anthem that um, we're working on, and um, a Steely Dan song I really like called Berry Town, <laughs> and um, um, some originals, and um, 
There's a song of, of Luciana Souza's called Do Tell yeah. that we've been doing. We like a lot. Yeah, and, um, and our friend, Australian singer, she's really wonderful, Gian Slater. She has a song that we're doing now. So not some some not so much contemporary pop music, but definitely some stuff from contemporary jazz composers. jazz composers. Well, when it comes to the way you do different songs, though, I don't think that your audience would really stop and think, "Oh, that's from the '40s," or "Oh, that's from the the '30s," yeah. or whatever, because it all sounds like it's from today anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you're trying to put across, but it sounds that way to me that you're. All of your songs sound really fresh. Oh, and thanks. And not dated yep. at all. Thanks. Well, you're not necessarily trying to make them not sound old, but I guess just in the process of just trying to make them, uh, you know. More relevant to us, they end up yeah. not sounding old. Because I think that because those kind of lyrics that were all written back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, it's easy for them to, to feel dated or to feel irrelevant. So once it has a a story um, for me, and there's a story I want to tell them, and we have the arrangement that, that, that also supports that, then it, it feels like those lyrics don't feel, um, yeah, they don't feel from a long time ago anymore, even if they reference things that, you know, aren't, aren't common for our modern days. Now, you're going to be a part of the Art of Cool Festival coming up in a couple of weeks here in Durham, North Carolina. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really, I know you're looking forward to that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, we're going to be playing at um, BU Cafe on uh, Friday the 25th, and it's the first day of the festival. Um, and I think our slot is at 8 p.m. 8, 8 to 9. 8 yeah. to 9, right. And, um, but I think you, you have to get a, you know, a pass for the whole day. You can't just come to one show, I think. Right? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, okay. Uh, I think so. Are you I'm, sure? I'm, not, I'm sure all the info is on on the. Yeah, you have art, to go to Art Cool, but as far cool as I website. know, there's not there's not um, separate entrance for each show. There's you get a wristband, and then you can yeah, go to anything you want. Right, you get. And there's like you know twenty or thirty bands each day. Right, in all like ten venues. It's an it's an amazing thing. Yeah, it's uh, a huge huge thing that they're doing. It's pretty I, incredible. And I, I yeah, I really hope that they. Um, are successful in terms of that that the public comes out and supports it and buys the tickets. They need people to buy the tickets, you know, because uh, well, when when they it. when when they initially um, uh, crowdsourced the funding to put this on, they got more than they asked for. So I think that they're going to be very well supported. Oh, good, oh, good. great. And I know we're all we're all looking forward to it. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it should be really. It's cool. good. It's like a huge party, you know, that's just going on and on and on and on, and, and, and that can suit all different tastes. That's what I love. It's, it's really eclectic uh, lineup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It kind of reminds I, I, me. Um, what did you say? Oh, I was going to say, um, back in the seventies, I I spent a semester in New York going to Fordham, and there was this jazz festival. I think it was called Newport. Mm -hmm. Newport. But they had they had all of these different venues where they had jazz going on, and this is what Art of Cool reminds me of, where it's like the whole city celebrating music. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say um, I had uh, there was a, a press agent from New York who called me and and he he was like, I've just been reading about this lineup for this festival you've got down there. This is like. The hottest lineup I've seen anywhere. Like, what is this? How'd you get on this on this festival? Like, who's uh, who's putting this together? And he's like totally excited about it. And uh, so I think it's making a you know making a mark. Yeah, this is the first time that they've ever done this. So look for Art of Cool if you're curious. And even if you're a jazz promoter, a music promoter. Uh, go online, even if you're not in Durham, North Carolina, check it out, see what they're doing, because it's pretty astonishing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to know, um, in terms of your, your music and your travels, um, how often do you get to go on tour? Um, are you the types of musicians that are on tour all the time? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of... We go out. We we tend to have like one or two things a month, and that are maybe 
you know, around or, or, or where we have to go somewhere and then and then, you know, come home in between or I'll go off and do teaching or, or recording somewhere or he'll be doing gigs. So we do a lot of different things, you know. But oh, so you, so you work separately and together? Mm-hmm. Okay. And we're not, yeah, we're not really the type that would like to live on the road, you know. Yeah, we don't do that well on the road <laughs> for long periods of time. So, uh, yeah, so... You know, like she said, we'll every month or two, you know, we'll have a few gigs <clears throat> out of town that we'll go do, and in between we'll teach and do other side gigs and, and work on, you know, work on our project. Yeah. So, what's the funnest, if that's a word, uh, funnest place you've ever performed at? Huh. That's an interesting question. We've been ever, you know, been all over the world. Uh, my favorite places are usually really intimate places, like house concerts are my favorite. Really? Why is that? Even if we do, you know, big festivals or play for thousands of people or something like that, my favorite is just like, you know, a hundred people sitting close together in a small room and just, um, you know. That's what I like best. And, and we, there's a great place in Sebastopol, um, mm, California, yeah. that we love. Um, and, uh, you know, when when we finish the concert, we can go outside and pet goats or, you know, go into uh, they're growing food and, and everything right there. But then everybody comes from the community for these concerts, you know, like once a month at this guy's house and they all put in their money and you get paid really well and then they all they all buy CDs and they all bring food and wine and so you eat together and sit together and it's totally it's just great it, to me that is that's the new way that it should be done we shouldn't have to worry you know I mean like I don't know I, I think that is a sustainable model you can if somebody just has enough room in their house and and have a good a sound system then they can you know bring people in from wherever well, actually, I want to do something like that because a friend of mine back home, he's, he's a Brazilian drummer, and a friend of his is a guitar player named Tonio Rota, and <laughs> apparently... He's, he's my favorite. Oh, he's awesome. He's awesome. They're both from Minas Gerais. But this cat has, in his backyard, the most beautiful setting for music. And I want to slowly get there because I actually want to try my hand at it, just having little little house concerts. And Tonio Ota has like flowers everywhere and like little like little, you know, places for the musicians to hang out and I know that's definitely the way of the future because it's again, like you said, it's intimate, um, the sound is good, the vibes are good, um, people can actually talk to you. Which is yeah, nice. It's just, it's just about the music. It's not right. At, you know, at the same time as the business is going on, trying to sell a bunch of right. drinks and make money, and right. you know, uh, it's more, more just a pure, mm-hmm. pure musical situation. And and you get people who don't want to go out to clubs, and they don't want to, you know, you get a different kind of person at that sh- kind of show, and they're just uh, oftentimes, you know, they're not into like getting all fancied up or whatever. They just come and and they're just open. You know, that's what I like is that there's a kind of openness. And it's funny that you mentioned about Tanina Orta and because our, our third song on the record is a medley of his 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 music and one of them is is the song Oh Mina Jedi's. Yeah, Akio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Akio, right, right. Yeah. I have never heard anyone else cover Akio. I can't wait to hear it by I haven't heard it by you. <laughs> I can't wait to hear it. Wow. Yeah. So, we love I love his music and, and I've been singing his music for a really long time, maybe fifteen years, maybe longer. And and it, I feel like I learned the most from his it just has such a deep relationship with harmony and his his own singing is so beautiful and I don't know, I, I feel really connected to his, his music. What other composers um, do you like? Mm-hmm. I like Cole Porter a lot, <laughs> and uh, oh, Living Ones. Um, I'm a big fan of Luciana Souza composing. She's great. 
and uh, um, there's a lot. There's a lot of people. I like Maria Schneider's music so much. Beautiful, beautiful music. And John Hollenbeck. I work with him. He's an incredible composer. Um, yeah. I mean, there's so there's just so many. Those are just contemporary people that I play with and love. But, yeah. I can imagine the two of you just chilling, and listening to lots of music together. <laughs> oh my God, this isn't very much music. We actually don't listen to it. When we first right. got together, we did. I know, funny. Because we were like sharing with each other, you know, the things that we liked, but we, we actually don't end up. Yeah, we don't. Like, I thought you would just, like on, yeah, like on Sundays, just 18 hours straight, we're just listening to music. <laughs> Every once in a while, we put on some music and we'll dance around. That's fun. And um, we. Or, or if we're on a road trip, sometimes we'll listen, and that's really nice. Yeah. We have our favorites. We have some, like, there's um, a couple of songwriters that, um, Paul Carreri is one songwriter. We did one of his songs on Genevieve and Ferdinand, and sometimes we just put on his music, and we can listen to that for hours. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, we have sort of like our, our class. I guess we're often... Often around the house, where one one or the other of us is trying to work on some some music, so this yeah. and then if we if we're not, then we want to like go outside and do something else. So right. so yeah, mostly like on the on the on the road, that's more yeah. when we'll listen, listen to music, like in the car or on the plane or something. So for musicians at your level, you know, the international professional level. Um, do you feel obligated to check out certain musicians, or do you not go out much to listen to other musicians? I, I feel curious sometimes. I mean, if something, if I'm curious about something, I'll go. But for the most part, I feel like my time and my energy are just like there's so many demands on it, and it's a big commitment to like spend a night out watching somebody else's music, and and you know, I I. Probably should do it more, but I don't do it that much. <laughs> I think we mostly just do it if, if we're really, you know, if it's something we're really curious about. Or, or we're big fans or, of the yeah. person already. Like, yeah. like recently, uh, Luciana came to uh, do performances with Lionel Lecky and Ken, uh, Kendrick Scott and Massimo Bio Copy on bass. And we went to that, and that was just spectacular. Mm. Wow. wow. Yeah, I mean, there's so, there's tons of good music here, and and you know, if we when we can, we you know, like I saw Billy Childs and Diane Reeves, and um, last it, it was in the fall, it was an amazing, amazing show. Nice. I love Diane Reeves. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's great things being presented here all the time, and and you know. If I was, yeah, I mean, I always want to, and then I'm like, oh my god, I can't, you know, either I'm not in town or, you know, I don't have the energy, but I I would like to do, to see more things, because it is energizing for me. Oh, and I did, I yeah, just saw, I just saw Zakir Hussain, it was, it was very, you know, inspiring, very inspiring. How about that? Now, for people who want to get into your music, if they don't already know about you, what's the best way to do that? Is there a website they should uh, go to? KateMcGarry.com. Yeah, KateMcGarry.com. Yeah, there's a lot of music on there. Or if you just go on YouTube, there's tons of, you know, some some of them are better than others. <laughs> but and you could hear, uh, you know, if you if you go on the website or Google Genevieve and Ferdinand, you know, there's lots of places where you can hear clips of the songs, you know, um, off of, you know, various iTunes or Amazon or whatever. Yeah. And I'll and, add I'll add the link to the description of the show too. Right, we just put out a video of um, one of the tunes from the from the concert. Um, it's an original tune called Ten Little Indians." So if you um, yeah, that just, just got put out. Just so. went up on YouTube, and it's a video of the actual performance that is the CD that the yeah. CD is from. That's so that's cool. pretty cool. That I, I actually prefer that to to videos because I remember way back in the olden days when MTV first um, got started, the early Videos were just musicians performing the songs, uh -huh. and it became movie productions and all that kind. Of, I just rather see the musicians. <laughs> yeah. So, so thank you so much for being on the show, Kate oh, and Gary. 
Gans. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Good chat with you all day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just remind the folks, especially those who are local here to Durham, North Carolina, or Chapel Hill, Hillsboro, Raleigh, wherever. Um, Kate McGarry and Keith Gans will both be at the Art of Cool Festival together Friday, April 25th from 8 to 9 p.m. at the BU Cafe that's in downtown Durham. If you're anywhere in downtown Durham and cannot miss the BU, just follow the crowd. Yeah. Actually, there's, there's going to be lots of crowds because we're talking about Art of Cool and all the different venues will be a buzz with music. Right. It's going to be really fantastic. Um, Kate McGarry and Keith Gans's latest CD is called Genevieve and Ferdinand, and I'm guessing they can buy it at your website. On your website? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's on anywhere. If you go to Amazon or just plug, put it in, it's on iTunes, or or you can get it at a show from us live, or you can get it online. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again, you two, for being on the show. You. Yeah. Wonderful to, to talk with you. It was really fun. And if you would like to be on TV Sky Writer, I like to talk to authors, musicians, entrepreneurs, just creative people. Just write to me. Just write to Durham Skywriter at gmail.com. You can read the Durham Sky Writer, which is uh, what started all this. It's a community newspaper, which is all positive. It's online at durhamskywriter.com. I also do Radio Sky Writer. That has a local focus here at Durham, North Carolina. And that airs actually on Sundays, 6.30 p.m. Um, Eastern Time, on WNCU, that's the jazz station. And they're playing your music because I heard it. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's 90.7 FM um, oh, and also WNCU.org. Yeah. And it, it, that's in. wonderful. She's great. She's always playing her music and everybody there. I sing. Yeah, there's lots of, the, the, we love that radio station. It's nice to be so supported. Actually, that's where I met you because you were being interviewed on the air. Yeah, yeah. WNCU. Yeah. So definitely shouts out to WNCU. Yeah. Okay, folks, you have a great week. Thanks again for being on the show. Okay, thanks. Bye bye. Take care. See you, folks, next Sunday. Ciao.